Okay, go ahead. Get started. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. <coughs> Okay. My name well, is Larry yeah. Levy. I'm the new president of the Mecklenburg Audubon Society. I've replaced Steve Coggan. I want to thank Steve Coggan for being a wonderful president in the last two years. Where are you, Steve? Where are you? I also want to welcome everyone. We actually had 20 new members. And I'd like to see who's here among these new ones, or if you're new, period. Would you stand up and introduce your name to everyone? Let's see who's new here. Anyone? Any new members? Yay! Yay. 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 Bob Barnum. Hi. I'm Steve Bob Steve. Well, are you related to Sh are you related to Sheila? Yes. He okay. Is. He is. Okay. <laughs> it's your daughter. Hi, yes, I am too. Okay. <laughs> okay. Any other new people here? Any other new members or new folks here? I didn't been here that often. No. <laughs> That's the short answer, no. <laughs> I'd like to introduce you to uh, any of the board members who wait, are wait, here. Wait a minute, can't do that yet. Can't do I'd that like yet. to any of the board members here stand up, please. Wait, wait, what? wait, wait on that. Look at this slide, what we're talking about. This is first time for all of us, so. Okay, so what tonight's meeting is what? Unbelief, right? Yeah. Okay, so now we have some slides for pictures of folks did this summer. Do that one first. Oh, we haven't done this yet. No, we haven't done this yet. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. You okay. Want to narrate it? No. <laughs> well, these are uh, these are strummers, right? Over here. Raise your hand. Okay. Notice where they are. He spent the summer in uh, Denmark, right? Okay. Steve Coggin, the lower right one I'm very jealous of. Parasitic Jaeger. Yeah. That's Parasitic Jaeger. Okay. These are Richards. Um, I, he sent me more than this, but I went ahead and just added the females, since we don't get pictures of females very often. Right? Uh, and I love duckies, little duckies. Uh, this is Ray Nesbitt. Raise your hand, Ray. I know he's here. There he is. Right here. Uh, he's from his backyard. Very nice. Oh, yeah. Lights would help. Okay, now you can talk about the board. No. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted the board members who are here tonight to stand up just so you recognize them. These people are all volunteers helping arrange this program each month and working for you. failed you today. I'm really sorry. We have started a tradition of anyone who works for our board for two terms, six years. We award with a nice little plaque. And I want to give this to Judy and thank her for her six years of service. On the I want to say something else about Judy, too. You all know Judy. For many, many years, she's led bird trips in this area. I don't know how many. It must be hundreds, right, Judy? Hundreds. I get, I get that. Judy has devoted her career to the Spectrumburg <laughs> Audubon Society. And this is a small token, the best we can do for her tonight. But I want you to all thank her for all of the service that she has given all the years. Thank you. make it all well worth it, getting to know you all. It's so much fun to, to be out uh, with people, especially as you first become birders, and it's always fun to point out, you make me a better birder, so thank you. Just don't look at my technology 
stuff right now. <laughs> We're going to shoot computers. I, I hate computers. Here's Angel. Angel wants you to come up. Angel helped us out with refreshments. I'd like you all to thank Angel for arranging these refreshments. <laughs> Well, first of all, I want to say I do have a list, but in the interest of time, we're a little behind the tech stuff. Thank you to all the people who donated refreshments to us. That makes a really good meeting. And I'm going to, next month is October 5th. We're going to need refreshments again. And remember the four meeting food groups for a good meeting. All right? We've got sweet, salty, well, you know, savory, savory, healthy. Which could be could be the same as savory. Angela. 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 Oh, you want me here too? Yeah. And chocolate. Yes, yes. chocolate. Yes. And beverages. And beverages. So keep that kind of frame of mind as you as you sign up. Next. You just need to come closer to the mics over here now. Oh. <laughs> um, well, you can see that all the walks we have, which is pretty amazing. It's, that's a lot of volunteer hours on the part of our leaders, for sure. Uh, a lot of uh, you know, differences in the places we're going. Uh, some of the younger, newer leaders are starting to find some new places for us, which is, I think, real exciting. And we've got a few people that are interested in becoming guides and leaders. And if you are interested in doing that, let me know. We'll get you, you know, kind of on board with a mentor, perhaps, and uh, and see if we can get some walks for you. But, uh, our walks are generally from eight to eleven, and uh, we're trying to keep the size around. We we started doing twelve because of COVID restrictions. And uh, we decided that 12 is actually a really good size now. And so we're kind of keeping it at that. Um, the guides have some, uh, the leaders have some leeway on, you know, some discretion on how they do that. Do try to contact the leader, make sure you contact the leader, establish kind of communication with them. So if something comes up one way or the other, you can let them know. I guess that's about all I can say. What else do I need to say? That's it. Okay. There we go. Thank you, Richard. There's the new members. There's Adam and Suzanne. <laughs> right there. Yeah, there they are. Adam is not here tonight. Oh. He's their son. Okay. <laughs> Some... Okay. We're ready for our program now. You're going to wonder what this is all about. No, wait a minute. It's going to be wonderful. There that's, it is. That's next meeting. Next meeting, it's going to be Susan. Gagnon Sarah. from Sarah. UNC Charlotte. Sarah. Sarah Gagnon from UNC Charlotte. She's actually a landscape ecologist, a very interesting colleague of mine, and Judy Jordan. I've been pleased with her talk next month, so please come. Okay, we're ready for the program tonight. Yeah. This is all going to be about the ladies and the interviews, and we're going to start out with Steve. Oops. Sorry. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Pointer. What do you want? <laughs> Pointer. Okay, this June, 15 Mecklenburg Audubon boats Steve. went to Belize. Over here. Why? The camera. Mike. There's a mic here. 
A trip to Belize. Okay, next slide, please. Well, oh, well, that's because I just plugged in. There you go. Okay, here's Belize. It's a small country in Central America there. And you can see where Florida is. So it's relatively close and it's in the tropics. It's easy to get to. The uh, official language is English because it's an English colony for a long time. And here's a rough outline of our trip. There's the International Airport just outside Belize City. We went by van into the Rio Bravo Conservation Area. Over here, see this big patch of green? That's all a conserved area. That's all rainforest right there. Look at these areas that are lighter green. Richard's going to talk about what that means a little later. We spent several days uh, there, then we transferred over to the Crooked Tree Wildlife Sanctuary, where we spent several days, including a couple of boat trips and a trip to the Mayan city Lamanai. And before the trip and after the trip, some of our people did an archaeological extension. They went to Zanantanich here and to Caracol, which is down there off the map. And then some of us went out to one of the keys. This is the barrier reef of Belize. It's the second largest barrier reef in the world. And we went to Key Cocker, which is there. Uh, the geology of this area, it's all limestone. It's a limestone shell from there up to the tip of the Yucatan Peninsula. And one of the real attractions for this area is there are lots of Yucatan endemics that are in Mexico, in Belize, and a little bit in Guatemala. Guatemala is right there. Uh, our group, let me get my piece of paper so I don't forget anybody. Here we are on the road looking into a tropical savanna. Here we are in the rainforest. Here we are on a boat. You can see the water there and there. And our group, like I said, was 15. Let me just read off the group because a lot of the folks are here tonight. Diane and me, we were there. Uh, Charlene and Wanda Fortner, and they're not here. John and Diane Hillary, who are here. Uh, Terry and Carol Horton. Carol is here. But Terry couldn't make it tonight. Carrington Maynard, Richard Ann Picot, James Poling, who I saw him on Zoom, but yeah. I don't think he's going to be with us. Roberta Wood, who helped everyone check in this evening, and Janet and Ron Zip. So that was our crew for Belize. These were our guides. Uh, Ronnie and Abby were with us the whole time. And, in fact, Ronnie went with Diane and me to Key Cocker. And Amir was our guide for a day. He's a boat captain. He took us on the New River, and he guided us at the Lamanai Maya Archaeological Site. And, John, you had another guide, I think. Two other guides. Uh, I'll, I'll let John talk about that in a minute. Here are the two main places we stayed. In the Rio Robert Conservation Area, we stayed at Lamilpa La Milpa Eco Lodge. You can get a glimpse of the lodge here. This is our trusty van. And then at the Crooked Tree Wildlife Sanctuary, we stayed at the Bird's Eye View Lodge. And it's perched on the edge of the Crooked Tree Lagoon. It's this great uh, wet. And Archaeological sites. Do you know how it works? So this is your pointer. Okay, this is forward and back. Okay. So there were four of us that went on the archaeological extension, and it was a, a day before the, the extension. Is the day before the main group and the main trip? two days after, so we split it, and it's kind of an extension in both ways. The 
time before the main group, we were at the Milka the day before the rest of the group, and went up to see the, the Milka Mayan city. The, the Mayan cities that we visited, there were five altogether. Uh, this one, the Milka was unique, and it had not yet, or is not being excavated. So the first picture up here, this shows a uh, roof of a long house that's, that's buried by the forest canopy. And the way that the archaeologists have agreed to, to manage the Milpa is the archaeologists will come in and do their study, dig up what they want, analyze, record stuff, and put it all back. So when they walk away, it looks like it did when they showed up. Now that's, that's unique. The other four archaeological sites that we went to, they are doing a I would call it a permanent excavation. They're, they're taking the material away and then leaving it somewhere else so you can see the buildings the way they were uh, 1,300 some years ago. So when we were touring Lenopa, it was unique. Without the guide, we would have been really lost because the guide was telling us, well, this you can tell this is so the top of a royal house or a temple or, or a place where looters came in. But if, if I was walking through by myself, I, I probably would have missed it all, or just about all of it. So that was one place where you really needed the guy. And he was very handy. And I didn't think to take pictures of the guides. And, and I was the one with the camera on this part of the trip. So you don't see pictures of our guides because that's not the, what, what was in my mind when we were doing it that day. I thought it all the way through, I knew that this presentation would have a goal for that. I would have taken some pictures of the guides. So that was the first place we went to. We spent, uh, I would say, about four hours there. Uh, the first full day that we were in the country. The other uh, archaeological site, or Mayan city, that I'm going to mention here is Lamini. And this is the one we went to with the whole group together. So all 15 of us went to Lamini. It was part of the, the main tour as well. And you can see the other members of the group admiring some of the temples and exercising on some of the temples. <laughs> the, it was uh, hot and sunny that day, and not all of us wanted to get out and break the sweat. Many did, as you can see. Um, so the Lamadai architectural uh, Mayan city is on the, the river. Was it the New River? It was on the New River. And we used boats to get there and boats to get back. And in addition to viewing the Mayan city ruins that had been excavated like this, we also did a lot of birding. So it was, it was a mixed visit. You see other pictures, not in this part of the presentation, but there are other pictures of the animals that we saw at the Memai site. A couple other sites, I said there were five altogether. So we went to Alton Ha, this one. It is very close to the Caribbean Sea. I think it's probably between five and 10 miles from, from the coast. You can see some palm fronds in the background here. That's, that's my trigger. Say, so, oh yeah, that's an Alton Ha picture. And it has some uh, interesting ruins. They've, they've all been excavated and, and they're left in a way that uh, the visitor, it's pretty obvious when you're looking at a temple in which temple, if you look at the map, you can kind of find your way around. So these were ones where the, you could probably guide yourself with a little bit of help, a New York guidebook or something. Um, we did spend a lot of time there. I didn't take a lot of pictures there. Only my mind took me to some of these two. <laughs> so another one that we went to that same day is an Anzumich. is kind of on the other, the western side of the lease. It's very close to the Guatemalan border. And um, this, this is how we got there. It's across the river from the, the main road. And the, the way the cars get across the river is you drive onto the ferry, and then someone cranks this crank until the ferry's on the other side of the river, and then you drive off. <laughs> and, uh, they have to Oh, it was his job. <laughs> 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 the 
this is uh, facing north in the Zuni Incidence, uh, standing on top of, of the El Castillo, the tallest of the Mayan temples that was left, probably the tallest that was there, and facing south. So, so what you see in distance here is um, central, and maybe a little bit north of uh, Belize. And over on the left here is Guatemala. We could, and I didn't put pictures of it, but if you look to the left and you got your binoculars out, you can see some roads and some cars in Guatemala. That's how close we were to the border uh, on the western side. This is, is quite prominent. The, the top you can see is it's well above the creek canopy. And you can kind of imagine the people that live there. Um, when you get up on top and when you look down, you, you can see everything, and it's well designed for acoustics, I'm told. And so people can hear the person on the top or the people on top, what they're singing or what they're saying. It, um, you know, we weren't there, so we don't really know what it felt like, but I can kind of see how the people on top were above the people down below. It's <laughs> kind of the feeling that I got just from visiting. And then the fifth uh, archaeological site, Caracol, has it's the tallest building in Belize today. So it's, it says a little bit about how developed Belize is, but it says a lot about what, how it was developed it was 1,300 years ago. It's, it's still standing, and here we're on top of that building, so that there's a, a way to climb up. Looking, in this case, looking south, and Guatemala is obscured. You can't really see into it in this case, but it was also very near the Guatemala border. And at the archaeological site, they had armed guards because people, it's, it's an open border. And they didn't want people using it as an open border, so they were guarding against migration against so visitors from Guatemala. Yeah. This shows some of the artwork on the temples. And it also appears in this photo. So this is the same piece of, of, of carving. The, the guy can read this. There, there's, there's writing in here in a language that I don't understand. And, but the guy, uh, both, both the guys the guy said they had some Mayan heritage. I think the first guy said he was half Mayan. And they learned some of this. That's it. But it's, uh, I don't remember what it said. <laughs> Beautiful place, and these tall, prominent places. Uh, it, it must have been something. I, they told us how many people they estimated were living here, and it's, it's thousands. They, they thought that in these cities, this this one was the largest. It might have had as much as a hundred thousand individuals that lived there. It was, there was a lot going on a long time ago before the Mayan civilization collapsed. In case you haven't added it up, that, that collapse happened somewhere in the 800 to 1000 AD time frame. So it's it's before the Europeans started showing up. Do you know how tall that building is? I don't remember the number, Ron. Do you remember? Uh, 144. Yeah, I don't. I, I didn't remember. As we were leaving the, that tall pyramid at, at Caracol, the guy heard something. This is Eddie Oni. I think they were a picture of the guy <laughs> from the back. Heard something, and he took us off the path into the jungle in between the snakes and whatever else was out there <laughs> safely, I'm sure. And then uh, what he heard was a Kill Bill Toucan. To me, I, I heard a tree frog. I could just walk. <laughs> <laughs> that was what I heard. Kill Bill Toucan. And then later, Going down the trail, we saw that song tail There was actually three of them on that tree. I couldn't get, get all of them in. When you're taking pictures in the jungle, you, you move a little bit to the left and everything up, and, and you move a little bit to the right, it's just it's hard to find that hole. And we got that practiced over and over again. It's true. Okay, 
Now we're going to move on to the section of birds, and we're going to change speakers. Is this a time for all of us? Okay. All right. You keep moving away from the mic. Move up here. Okay. I'll start this. These are my pictures. I'm just standing here. Richard starts. <laughs> These are mostly my pictures. You've been hearing about AI lately? <laughs> okay. Um, these two are fully the real thing. The snail kite was sitting on that branch, and I got the whole snail kite in every shot, except for when the wing was fully extended. Photoshop AI filled that in. It's <laughs> terrifying. It is oh. terrifying. So don't believe anything you see. <laughs> but we saw the snail kite on the river. So we were going to Lamanai, and the limpkin was um, at uh, the uh, a cricket tree. And, and this was on the river too, the Great Eagle. So um, the the river system. Could you explain a little bit about the river system? Because the rivers don't go anywhere. Yeah. They have a system where they flow in the rainy season from the lagoon out, and then in the dry season, back into the lagoon. Yeah. The hydrology was really complicated. I've never really got a complete yeah. handle on it. But that new river does flow into the Caribbean up near the Mexican border. So that one does go somewhere. But a lot of these other wetlands, like Richard said, they just move the water around. We saw some hummingbirds. We have lots of hummingbirds, especially around the hill. Okay. Um, a she and a he rebellion flag picture. Mm -hmm. And uh, Richard Preston Spontail, that's me. Yes. And uh, the Houston flag catcher, believe it or not, is also a Houston condemned. These are Steve's. <coughs> That red cap mannequin, that's a male, and he was singing. I think it was the first day we were there, we were hiking through the jungle. That Stay. was like the first like bird we got eyes on that was a little bit more human, like in the jungle. So that was really cool. Stayed there for a long time. For a long time. And there were two or three of them that were kind of calling back and forth, and, you know, getting to try to get eyes on them. And that was just so much fun. We had oscillated turkeys that frequented. Uh, which was really cool. Uh, there are how many chicks, young babies? It's like there are two or three. You'd see them walking around with babies yeah. most days. And oscillated turkeys feel like a turkey that's got peacock envy. Yeah. <laughs> crazy colors. Yeah, absolutely stunning. It's great Curacao, you know, who's also walking around with lots of playing cha cha laka. Yeah, those were all on the grounds that were built. Our trogons, there were four species that we were targeting, and I think we saw all four, which was really cool. Um, I think the garter we saw first, um, and some of us got better shots and sights of sound than the others. But, um, that road's had hawks out there for a while. I think we all got really, really decent pictures of that from the van. We sat there for probably just looking at it and shooting pictures of it. It was really reminiscent of a red shoulder hawk, about the yeah. same size, similar color pattern. It's a real nice little hawk. And along the river, we had green kingfishers. And the road throws rose through a tanager there in the corner. There's another Yucatan in the day. We saw that. I think on one of our road trips, we went from here to there, and we stopped. Steve and Diane had a lessons mot mot, um, which was really, really cool. We, some of us were really trying to see it, and Steve was like, oh yeah, you know, we'll show you. And we, some of us got patient, and we like went and tried to look for it ourselves. But we couldn't find it, couldn't find it. And then they rejoined us behind their dorm, and they were like, yeah, just sit here, wait, it'll come out in about 10 minutes, and sure, shoot. There was a lessons mot mot eating something, so we all got really good shots of that, which was cool. Got a chestnut colored woodpecker down in the bottom left corner. Um, that was at Lamanai. 
What's it? Yeah. Are you Katina and Jay's we hunted for for a little while? And that was at Crooked Tree. Um, we were like hunting for them, hunting for them, hunting for them, and all of a sudden we saw like these flashes of like blue and black. And like, oh, there they are in the field. There's like four more. And it was, it was really cool to see. Uh, like those white fronted parents over on the right side. We saw quite a few parrot species, probably yeah. half a dozen maybe. So it was, you know, I feel like trogons and motmots and parrots just scream tropics. Toucans. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it was so emblematic of the tropics in the Americas. There's another one of our trogons, the black headed trogon, instead of being guarded, turned into a bird. Um, yeah. I can't remember which one was the trickiest to find. Those are some excellent shots of acorn woodpeckers. We, we stumbled upon them um, actually the same day we saw a bunch of Yucatan endemics, which I think Diane will talk about in a little bit. Um, but it was it was a really cool sight to see what two adults and two young ones. Young ones, two. Young ones. Um, there's a russet named Woodbrail, which that looks like your picture. It was on the boat. Yeah, that was a shot taken from the boat. <laughs> And the boat billed heron was one I was really, really stoked to see. It looks like something, it looks like the little shovel birds out of Alice in Wonderland to me, obviously. The boat bill, but I just think it's good. We had, every day was exciting, but, and, and the birds were a great part of it. But it was really the whole experience that made the trip really exciting. I mean, you're in a, a new place with new landscapes, you're with new people, and you're seeing new birds and all kinds of exciting animals like monkeys and hickories. So it, it was just an exciting time. Um, at La Milpa, we started off early in the morning, and we would all sort of stroll down to the to the lodge, and we it was not a big lodge. There was a, a kitchen with a cafeteria and there was a patio with chairs and there were hummingbird feeders hanging all around the patio and you get down there in the morning and the coffee was brewing and there was fruit juice and water and you brought your binoculars and you got your first cup of coffee and you went around and there were just birds everywhere. The birds they saw at first, the, the curacaos and the chachalacas and the turkeys were just sort of wandering around in the area around the lodge and you could just drink your coffee and just watch them just feeding and watch the little babies following behind them. And the staff at La Milpa were just so nice. A lot of those people had worked there for years, especially the lady that did most of the cooking. And she would stand there every meal. We would, we would eat our breakfast and our lunch out on the patio with all these hummingbirds zooming around. And generally we ate dinner in the cafeteria closer to the kitchen. But she stood there every morning and smiled and, and answered questions about what she had cooked. And they were all seemed so excited to have us there. It was just a great experience. This was one morning when we got on the bus and we headed down this road. We had to stop because the road was so sandy, we were afraid the, the bus was gonna get stuck. So we all got out and we probably had not walked more than 10 or 15 feet when they spotted these ferruginous pygmy owls in a tree. And not only was there one, there were three. <laughs> and they sat there forever and let us take pictures of them. And in the meantime, the Yucatan Jay was fluttering around in the background. And then we walked about another 10 or 15 feet down the road, and there was the Altamira Oriole just glowing on this branch of the tree. It was, it was really exciting. And the acorn woodpeckers are one of my favorites. And although you can see those in the, in the U.S., in Arizona, and some other places in the West, they are just funny little birds. They have funny markings. Um, the interesting thing about acorn woodpeckers is they, um, they tend to be in groups. Generally, you see woodpeckers, they're, they're pretty solitary, but um, acorn woodpeckers are very unusual 
They live in large groups, they hoard acorns, and they breed cooperatively, which means one year's brood will stay around and help feed the next year's brood. So lots of times when you see acorn woodpeckers, you see quite a few of them at one time. And these were all lined up on the telephone pole and in the hole, and they peck these holes in, in the tree, and they store their, their acorns in there. Now, they don't make the hole deep enough that the sap runs because they want the acorns to dry out and store them for the winter. But sometimes you'll come upon a tree that just has hundreds of holes in it full of acorns. It's just exciting to see. Um, and of course, we saw dusky capped wood, I'm sorry, dusky capped flycatchers. And another good thing that we saw when we were at Crooked Tree was on the lagoon in the morning. You get up and you go to the kitchen and you get your first cup of coffee. And you stand out on the on the, the beach or the shore or you could stand on the balcony and these great roseate spoonbills would just come flying over the lagoon. It was a real treat. So it was a good time. Um, well, this uh, white tree at, at the Mamuka Lodge attracted a lot of hummingbirds, and it was fun to watch them come in. The toady mopots were hanging out in the jungle. Not very, not, not very, yeah, not very big, and they didn't, I didn't want to scare them off, so I stayed where they could take them off. Although, but this bird focuses a foot on this bird is so large it's able to stand on top of lily pads and give the illusion that the bird gets a lot of water. It's a jacana, northern jacana. Jesus Christ bird. Sometimes known as the Jesus Christ bird. <laughs> and then when we finally got to see the jabbers at the causeway as we were coming into Crooked Tree, it, it was interesting to contrast it to the great egret or the Lurgeate spoonbill. Great eager, it's a pretty big bird. The Lurgeate star too. But the Jabiru's are just five feet tall, maybe. They're, they're very large. And one thing about the Tony um, it was just really cool. Our guides really hunted those down because they knew that we wanted to see those and they knew that uh, our best chance would be at La Milpa. And I remember, uh, I think it was after lunch at some point, um, Ronnie told us that Abby had seen some or heard some, and so it was like a whole endeavor to try to find those mont mots. Um, it just it spoke to the attentiveness and the expertise of our guidance, which was phenomenal. Some more, some more photos they took. The, hanging out at the little um, near the feeders, but on the opposite side. They were coming back to the same place, so it was fun taking pictures of them. The boat built here, in which I think we already saw one in a different one, an Amazon king fisher. I think there were also four species of kingfisher there that we were hoping to see. We did end up seeing all four, actually. It was, so I was checking to see if the next one was on there. Um, but when the pygmy kingfisher comes up, we'll tell us a quick story about that one. Oh, sure. Sure. Well, if it's not, there was a kingfisher in La Nova, which was very, very odd because it's in the middle of a jungle. Not terribly close to water. Um, and Charlene, I was like, we were, it was like downtime before dinner, and Charlene was like, Carrington, come here, now. And I was like, just give me a second, let me put down my back. She was like, get over here right now. Nobody's gonna believe me, now. And so I like walked over there with my camera. There was like a pygmy kingfisher just sitting in the tree. And we were shocked, we were like, what is it doing here? She was like, I didn't think anybody was gonna believe me if I didn't get another witness. Right. So, <laughs> yeah, she's like, you have to be my other witness. <laughs> So it was yeah, like most of the group got to see him. Yeah, because so, yeah. he sat there and he stayed for quite a while. Um, I was photographing, which is really cool. I took these also. <laughs> <laughs> um, I can't remember where I took the group building. 
this later on in the trip. Yeah, we saw those several places. And this one was the one that was in the best condition. Sometimes they were a little bit beat up. Another garter throat. They didn't really see how to make sure the garter throat. And then uh, Rufus Valley Pemberswreck was a lot near the lodge. Yes. These are from uh, uh, James Poling. This on the left is a tiger here. Uh, they are beautiful. Um, I don't have much more to say about them other than that. Um, so when, they're, when they're down, their neck goes all the way down, yeah. and you can't tell when it's got that long neck. So. And you can hardly tell. We actually had a big debate one day about like, whether it was a green hair, a little a green hair or a tiger hair. And we were like going back and forth, back and forth. And we called in the experts. Like We got back from our walk, and we asked the guides. We were like, please help us ID this. There's another white-headed parrot. Uh, that gray-throated chap, we had to put a lot of effort into finding, if I recall correctly. Mm -hmm. and, and the white-headed parrot is a species of special concern. It popped up on the road and put it in. So I think it's threatened by the community. It's found mostly in the Now we sit down, Steve. We saw some mammals. <laughs> At La Milpa, the Jeffrey spider monkeys were up in the trees right outside the, the lodge. The black howler monkey, they were a little further into the jungle. And black howler monkeys, uh, if you've ever heard of them, <laughs> you remember them. And what they sound like to me is the world's biggest dog. <laughs> <laughs> They're amazing. Loud. And a, a group of collared peccaries run across the trail in front of us one day. Uh, we also ran into some insects. That's a nymph with a giant red wing grasshopper. Uh, one of the sulfurs was there. Uh, I think it might be cloud of sulfur like we have here. But and there were three colors. Yeah. And that one on the right is called the Crayola katydid. Yeah. It's like <laughs> this big. And it had all these primary colors just like the Whipped them out a box of Crayola crayons, <laughs> and it was just sitting on a stick. I mean, that would be uh, a mock mock meal. <laughs> <laughs> it's some unidentified dragonfly. I saw an unidentified scorpion as I was walking back to my to my little lodging room. Uh, I'm really, you know, minding my business, walking, looking at the leaf cutter ants one night. I've got the flashlight, and then boom! Like it's a big scorpion, like this long, without the tail curled up, or with the tail curled up. It's like, oh my gosh! And I got a video of it. I just didn't get it. It was really cool, and I, I will show you the video later. Too. I will. I, yeah. will. <laughs> I checked my shoes and my pillows after that. Yeah. <laughs> well, the night we went owling, and we found three species of owls. We had a black and white owl, and a barn owl, and a, what was a model? Yes, a model. A model yeah. owl, and she saw two black and white owls. We went out, and I guess we got back to the room about nine o'clock, and I went to my room. And they had cleaned the room that day, but there was a little more gecko poop around than I kind of remember from before they cleaned the room. The geckos get in and just do, you know, mm -hmm. just do the thing. Yeah. And so I thought, well, maybe there's something else in the room. So I got my flashlight and started looking around, and it wasn't the red rum tarantula, but it was a tarantula. It was about that big. And it was right over my bed. So we slept terribly that night. <laughs> we got somebody from the facility to come. A little short guy. He got up on the headboard. <laughs> And shoot it out. <laughs> we didn't have any air conditioning. Though. We had fans. We had really tall fans. And for those of us who are lucky enough to have one room, we had two fans. It would be quite an event. These are just more insects. The one on the right is a queen butterfly. It's a monarch mimic. And it's on tropical milkweed. It's just perfect. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Are these your those were mine. Oh. Really? I believe we used to pass up to enter. Yeah, the, it was really stark. You know, I think Steve was pointing out on the map the green areas and the not green areas. And when you get to the edge of the preserve, you go from flat farmland, rolling hills, lots of cows, <coughs> lots of different crops, to the original landscape. 
tried very hard to preserve that. But the Mennonites came to uh, Belize in the 1950s. I was reading about it yesterday. I think I've got my dates right. Mennonites are a, a sect, a, a religious sect that started in the 16th century. And uh, they were pacifists, and they uh, left um, Denmark Prussia, and then to <coughs> Russia, and then many of them came to Saskatchewan, and then they went to Mexico, and each time they left it was because the, their governments pretty much were trying to press them into military service, and so they, and anyway, the, the, the Belizean government, which I think at that time was, was when the, uh, the British still had Belize as, as the Honduras, uh, the British Honduras colony, uh, sort of invited them. Prospered and so lots of big farms, which you can see by that one up there. They can, you know, they can take down the landscape pretty fast. So. That's just tragic because you can literally see, like, almost as if it were a property line of like where the conservation area stops and where the, where the farm backs up to. It literally backs up to the jungles. That top left picture, that's right forest that's been just cleared. That's very reasonable. They'll have a good pasture and farm. Talk about the key? Yes, key copper. Diane and our guy Ronnie and I went to Belize City. We got on a boat. It takes an hour to get there from Belize City. And it's this small island perched on a very reef. There are probably a thousand people on the island. As far as I can tell, the whole economy is tourist-based, but the tourists do lots of different things on that. There's a lot of scuba diving, there's a lot of snorkeling, there's a lot of fishing, and uh, this was a compound of Rastafarians that we walk by every day. And you know, they've got the red, green, black, and gold colors of uh, Ethiopia on their fence. They just have lots of interesting messages on the fence. <laughs> on the left, repent, Babylon has fallen, and there are pictures of people I think they viewed as needing repentance. Mm -hmm. Over on the top left is Idi Amin, that black and white picture, I'm pretty sure that's from the Yalta conference, it's got Stalin, Churchill, uh, Roosevelt, there's Adolf Hitler and Mussolini, Osama bin Laden, Joe Biden, Vladimir Putin, yeah. Kim Jong-un, Jin Xiaoping, <laughs> they have got a real opinion piece out there for everyone that walks by to see. Uh, a little further down, these are some people I do like. On the right is the Emperor Haile Selassie, who's the basis for the Rastafarian religion. I don't know who the guy next to him is, but there's the flag with the Lion of Zion. And uh, I think that's sitting bull on the left. So those are some people they admire. It's just a really interesting place. Uh, we saw more endemics there. The Yucatan Mirio. Yucatan Mirio. Uh, the Santa Hummingbird is usually found along the coast in that area. And it's got this beautiful, glowing cinnamon color. It's found in most of the gardens we walk by. Uh, the Caribbean Alania is scattered around the edge of the Caribbean. I'd seen them once before on the, the dry forest of Puerto Rico. I thought it was a life bird, so I went back and looked at the list and said, oh, I'd seen that before. And uh, the white crowned pigeons are not endemic, but they're found throughout the Caribbean and up into the Keys. And you may have found them sometime in the Keys. It's just a very striking bird with those, the dark gray body and the bright red feet and the beautiful white crown. Next slide. The real reason we went to Key Cocker is the black. Now, we've seen a couple of black cat birds in other places on the mainland, but, you know, this is endemic to that section of the Caribbean coast. Mexico, Belize, and Guatemala. And the ones that we saw on the mainland, they were kind of shy, and they wouldn't stay around very long. But on the island, they were abundant and fearless. And I've just been fascinated by them ever since the first time I saw a picture of the field guy. So I've got to see that bird, so finally. 
Mm-hmm. Got to see that. Well, we probably saw 20 or 30 or just in people's gardens and jumping around the mangroves, just everywhere. And speaking of mangroves, that's a yellow warbler, but there's this mangrove subspecies that lives in the mangroves of Central America, and they've got this reddish brown head. Otherwise, it would it sound like a normal yellow warbler. And there's this tiny airstrip. Afternoon, I guess we went there. We had to walk there to get to a better place, and there were three lesser nighthawks just zooming around at ten feet high on the end of the airport. And you know, Colossians have seen lesser nighthawks out west, but it's a really subtle. Here's some not subtle evidence. Uh, <laughs> the magnificent frigate birds were abundant. Fishermen would go out and they'd take tourists out fishing and they'd catch fish for the restaurants. And they'd clean them there on the beach. Wherever they were cleaning fish, there was a big bunch of magnificent frigate birds. Sometimes the guys cleaning the fish would toss them up in the air and the frigate birds would take them out of the air. It was quite a show. And typical brown pelican, it's a reddish egret, was in a, a little uh, salt pan pond. We had a whole family of clapper rails walking through the mangroves. And one adult, two or three juveniles. And, you know, how often do you get that close to looking? Clap a rail in the eyes. <laughs> Amazing. And down there in the lower right hand corner, common blackhawks are there. And in that part of the world, common blackhawks mostly make their living catching crabs. This one was being harassed by two tropical kingbirds. Those kingbirds were diving on it and just trying to get it out of the area. Well, this picture of the bats, that was outside our room at the Milpa. <laughs> Not just two bats. Here's a That's baby. A baby bat, right there, oh. hanging on the belly of that presumably mama bat. So you see how big that baby is. You see how big that bat is. That bat just flies around all night, <laughs> catching insects, carrying a baby, flying, <laughs> nursing at the same time. This is not a bat. <laughs> That's a, a ten-foot crocodile crawled up on the beach, mm-hmm. key car. I think that is the end of the show. Mm-hmm. And I think any of us at Lynn would be happy to answer questions or just talk. For mosquitoes or bad insects, can you okay. for you? <laughs>